Welcome to the seminar series on sewer and pipeline engineering. My name is Bernd Bossela. I am the scientific director of the IKT, Institute for Underground Infrastructure. In this seminar session, we will deal with the topic of the service life of sewers and pipelines. I would like to proceed in four steps. First, I would like to talk about the concept of service life and what other terms and interpretations there are in this context. Then I would like to talk about how we often put materials and rehabilitation methods in direct connection with the estimation of service life. After that, I will discuss what requirements we need to place on the service life of our networks in a true smart municipal infrastructure. And finally, I will report on some very practical experiences from our research and product testing projects at the IKT. And perhaps that will also answer a few open questions. Let us start with terminology. In many sources, the concept of service life is viewed from two angles. On the one hand, service life represents an empirical value from the past that tells us how long a certain type of object has usually been used. It is therefore a kind of average well value from previously observed service lives. Another view looks into the future. Here, planning estimates how long a structure or component can be expected to be used. That means how long it can perform its assigned function without change. In both cases, however, it is a question of how long a structure was actually and truly needed by the users or will be needed in the future. Actually, this sounds very plausible, almost trivial, in practice, however, many other terms are used that are often equated with the term service life, but actually mean something completely different. And that can lead to misunderstandings, and this is what I would like to address now. On this slide, we see five terms that are often used as synonymous with service life, but mean something different. Number one is durability. This refers to the period of time that a structure or component fulfills defined performance targets. These are primarily structural safety, operational reliability and tightness. In principle, this means how long will the component last? How long can we use it for its actual purpose? That is a typical technical definition and many technicians and engineers also think of the term service life as exactly that the durability of a structure or component. The second term is depreciation period. This is a commercial term. It describes the time over which an asset loses value. And these losses must be recovered through some revenue. If the period is short, the revenue targets per year are greater than if the asset value can be recovered over a longer period. Prudent business people naturally set this period as short as possible so that they can be sure that the asset is still functional and able to produce the desired return. That is why business people usually think of the depreciation period when they hear the term service life. The third term sounds the same. It is also called depreciation period. However, it is about fees and charges. In the calculation of fees, the aim is to match the actual period of use as closely as possible, so that citizens only pay very fairly for the period they themselves actually use the infrastructure system. The fourth definition is the financing period. Here, however, we are only talking about the time we need to repay a loan with which we finance parts of the infrastructure. This actually has nothing to do with the actual service life of a plant or system. Finally, there is the concept of lifetime, often used by analogy from other areas, for example, the insurance industry. I avoid this term, however, because I am firmly convinced sewers do not live. So the first three terms are actually the most interesting. Here, technicians and business people speak of service life and often mean something else, and that is durability or depreciation. This equation then unfortunately often leads to the opinion that depreciation period and durability are the same thing. 
This would mean, however, that the depreciation period of a component is exactly as long as the durability of this component. Then the user is no longer asked whether or not he or she wants to use the component for that long at all. But life is not that simple. It would be more correct to assume that the terms set limits for each other. And this can be thought of as a series of inequalities. The durability of the component must be at least as long as the service life. This also means that a user can, of course, terminate use before durability is reached. This is the case, for example, when an old copper telecommunications line has to be replaced by a fiber optic cable, even though the copper line is still intact, that it is simply because the customer, that means the user, wants more performance. The actual service life must then again be at least as long as the commercial depreciation period. After all, the user pays for the service and only if he or she pays can we recover the depreciation. The only equation that is permissible is that between depreciation for the calculation of charges and service lives. This is because it is a matter of fairness that charges should only be levied if the component and system is also used. So we have clarified the basics. Now let's move on to typical service life discussions involving materials and rehabilitation methods. If we look at our system of inequalities, it is immediately apparent that the term durability is of course closely related to the pipe materials. It is all the more important here not to automatically equate the term durability with service life. Otherwise, we would be forcing the user to use the component for as long as it lasts. That would be a kind of mandatory use, which of course we don't want. Let's think of the copper cable again. It should not be mandatory to use it until the end of its durability, but we should be able to replace it before. The discussion is even more difficult when it comes to rehabilitation methods. Here, people often talk about different service lives for the different method groups, and engineers then equate this with the durability of these methods. Then you hear things like, a repair only lasts 2 to 15 years, but a new renewal lasts much longer. But that is not at all what is meant when we differentiate between the duration of method groups. This is really about use, not about durability. If, for example, we repair a local defect in a sewer section, we do not change anything substantial in the sewer. After the repair, the sewer can only continue to be used in the way it was originally planned. And then it is quite clear that the maximum period of use of the repaired section corresponds exactly to the remaining period of use of the sewer itself. And since older sewers are repaired more frequently than new sewers, this remaining useful life is usually short. We estimate the average at 2 to 15 years. However, this does not mean that the repaired sewer will be broken again after two years. It only means that the repaired pipe will no longer be used if the sewer as a whole has to be taken out of surface. It is similar with renovation. The old substance remains intact. This means that, for example, the hydraulic capacity of the sewer is usually not changed. The sewer therefore continues to correspond hydraulically to an old design. So, it is also likely that the future service life will not be as long as in the case of a renewal, even if the sewer is still sufficiently stable and watertight. The longer service lives, of course, can therefore be assumed for new construction or renewal, because in these cases all functions of the sewer are designed for current and perhaps even for future requirements. So we have learned that the service life is the period of time that the sewer is actually used. But there are also external boundary conditions that can affect the service life. One example is smart community infrastructures, and this is what I would like to talk about now. According to ISO standards, we speak of smart community infrastructures when technological improvements increase the sustainability and the resilience of the systems. 
The goal is also that all infrastructures in a municipality are considered together as a system of systems. This applies, for example, to the areas of energy, transport, waste, ICT and water, as we see in this picture. Then the system of systems is operated in an optimized manner over the various service lives of the individual infrastructures. And it is easy to imagine that there are many interactions here. Construction, operation and rehabilitation of one infrastructure has an impact on the corresponding phases of the other infrastructures. We are already familiar with this when, for example, the construction of a sewer disrupts the road and traffic. Or if, when the power supply fails, the pumps and the water supply then fail too. And the ICT network can of course be an essential basis for the control of other infrastructures, so that a disruption directly results in operational effects in other networks. In any case, the individual infrastructures are no longer planned in isolation, but their service lives are coordinated in such a way that construction and operating costs can be reduced overall. That is then really smart. Finally, I would now like to talk about some structural engineering findings from our IKT research and product testing projects that have an interesting connection to the topic of service life. And perhaps this will also answer some still open questions. The first example is about the question of whether the durability of a repair and a renovation must be different. After all, we have learned that the service life of a repair is assumed to be shorter than that of a renovation. The reason was that a repair is only a local measure so that the sewer section can reach its assigned service life. And this remaining service life of an old sewer is naturally shorter than that of a renovated or renewed sewer. From this follows that many rehabilitation providers also consider their repair methods only as a short-term measure, so they optimize the materials primarily for quick, short-term use. In this picture we now see two scenarios for a sewer repair in which the same procedure is used once as part of a liner renovation of the main sewer and once as a standalone repair for a single connection. So what about durability in these cases? At IKT, we have checked this with a large number of injection methods in a comparative product test. In this picture, we see the damage situations that were built up in the laboratory and had to be repaired by all injection methods. In the upper row, we see the task of integrating the connection in the course of a liner rehabilitation. In the lower row, we see the task of, con of a connection repair as a purely local measure. And let us now take a look at the results. Here we see the results for the quality of the injection methods in the case of reconnecting the laterals as a part of a liner rehabilitation. You can download this table free of charge from our website. The most important thing here was there were large differences in quality ranging from very good to poor results. Here we see the results table for the second case the mere repair of a single lateral connection in a non-rehabilitated main sewer. Here too the results varied substantially. Again, there were large differences in quality ranging from very good to poor or deficient results. Here we see example pictures of poor quality rehabilitation in our test. The rehabilitated connections lie deep in our test stand and are under external water pressure after rehabilitation, that means a groundwater simulation. In this case, we see complete failure on the left despite rehabilitation. Large masses of water break into the sewer. On the right, we see smaller but still clearly recognizable infiltrations. Above, a small water jet, below, wetness with drip formation. In the test, such defects were mostly already visible directly after rehabilitation. But there were also very good rehabilitation results. This connection here was absolutely tight even after simulating 40 years of operation, for example through repeated sewer cleaning. There is some material removal in the upper area, but this is irrelevant for the tightness, operational safety and stability of the connection. 
The decisive factor was that the results essentially depended on the product and the company installing it, but not on its use as a repair or renovation method. The mere classification in one of these groups does not say anything about durability. The classification is just a requirement for durability. Of course, renovation methods must last longer than repair methods, but whether they actually do depends on the product. And the product does not only include the material of the rehabilitation method. We already know that. We remember the manhole renovation. The success of a ceiling against external water pressure depends not only on the coating material alone, but also on the contact and bond to the substrate. Even if the coating material is strong enough in itself, poor strength of the substrate can lead to detachment and water blistering. As we see here with water blisters in manhole coatings. Responsible for the failure of the coating is the lack of bond strength in the edge area, which leads to ever larger blisters and ultimately to tearing or cracking of the affected area. Substrate preparation is therefore part of the product and is also decisive for the durability of the coating. Another case of system behavior is the pipe salt system itself. Here we see a test of the pipe salt system using the MAC method developed further at IKT. We press the sewer gently from the inside with a press and measure the deformations. All this of course in the non-destructive range. Depending on the quality of the pipe and the soil, the entire system reacts with the necessary stiffness or it shows weaknesses. So not only the pipe quality but also the bedding quality is important for the durability of the sewer. And depending on what is weakened, pipe or soil, must then be improved by a repair or renovation. The process of the MAC procedure can be seen here. Step 3, the structural and service condition rating, is then especially important for assessing the durability and possible remaining service life of the old structure. Depending on the measurement results, the appropriate rehabilitation method can then be selected to improve the remaining service life. Here we see the results of several MAC measurements plotted over the length of the sewer of approximately 70 meters. The red line shows the original stiffness of the overall system of pipe and soil. The green line shows the stiffness after using an injection method. At one point, at 28 meters, there was no improvement. A subsequent lining of the pipe then resulted in a continuous improvement over the entire length of the sewer section. So we see here too, durability and thereby the possibility of a longer service life always requires that the entire technical system is considered. And this brings me to the end of this presentation on the service life of sewers and pipelines. We have seen what service life means, that is the actual period of use of a sewer or pipeline. We have also seen that there are many terms that are often considered to be synonymous with service life but actually mean something else, especially durability as an engineering term and depreciation period as a commercial term. Different service lives are also frequently assigned to different materials and renovation methods. But here too, use and durability are often confused. Ultimately, we have seen that the service life in a smart city also depends on the interaction of the infrastructures with each other. We then plan a system of systems. And our experience from research and product testing at the IKT confirmed many of the technical relationships that we have discussed in this session. Thank you.